Super excited to announce uh, a new partner that I'm working with, Meat Locker Official. They are a meat company. They ship um, all kinds of meat. Go check out their white web website, meatlocker.com. It's, a, it's amazing. Man, let me tell you, the bacon. The bacon's the best bacon I've ever had in my life. All the other meats are very good. I had a nice ribeye the other day, chicken breast, all kinds of stuff. The, the, the steaks and the bacon, though, mmm. For sure, the best bacon I've ever had in my life. Meatlocker.com. Type in the code name Easton2019. E A S T O N 2019, and you will receive 15% off of your order. Um, again, meatlocker.com. Get some bacon. Evo Labs. Uh, Evo Labs products. Um, man, I love a couple of Evo Labs products that I like to use. I like to use their uh, skin repair and intensive salve. Man, the skin repair is amazing for when I get like these little abrasions on my skin and we uh, and you know you you're always worried about like whether you're going to get an infection or not or how it's going to heal. Skin repair, Evo Labs skin repair. Go check them out, evolabs.com. And then two, their intensive salve. Okay, again, this is for like a little bit of soreness after I train. At the end of the day, rub it all over, um, like especially like my upper back and my arms, and then my legs. Love it. Again, evolabs.com. Uh, I do also like their meditate. It's a, it's a CBD pen where, um, you know, at the end of the night, it helps me calm down, go to sleep, especially after like, uh, intense training during the day. So, um, those three products are three of my favorite products from Evo Labs. One, the, the skin repair two the attend salve and three, the CBD pen. The gospel fire also brought to you by on it's O N N I T. Um, go to their website and man, go check out their products. Code name is Elliot. You put in Elliot, E L I O T, and you will get 10% off all of your on it products. I personally like the alpha brain. Uh, that, that is my favorite product. And every once in a while I like to use their shroom tech as well. So those, uh, those two products are my favorite from on it. So again, Evo labs guys at evolabs.com and on it. O N N I T. Um, check them out. Thanks for the support of the podcast from those guys and, uh, hell yeah, let's get after it. former UFC fighter Elliot Marshall, and this is the Gospel Fire, where we're going to go through the fire to learn how to live the best life possible. Back for another episode, Gospel Fire, with uh, with a pioneer of the game. He changed the game a little bit. My man, Mike Dolce. What's up, homie? What's up, Elliot? Good to catch up, brother. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. Life is awesome. Good. That's, that's the only way to do it, right? That's the only way to do it. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. What are you up to these days? Um, moved back east. So Livid just bought a, a house on the beach. I'm going to humble brag a little bit. Uh, moved back east to New Jersey where I was born and raised. Bought a home right on the beach. Went through that grind, the 13-year grind in the MMA world. And we, we saved up our pennies. We were clear. We were focused. We knew what we wanted to do. We had two babies. And once we had those babies, we knew it was time to change the trajectory of our business. Not to leave but just to change the way we operated to raise our girls back home around the grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. So we were able to do that successfully. And, uh, you know, I was at the beach this morning with the family and, and here nice. I am talking to you, sipping coffee. Fuck and, yeah. uh, we, you know, we still rule the game of, of the, the weight management world, uh, but we got a lot more going on, too. When you say, uh, what was, what was I going to ask you? God damn it. Where, um, where in New Jersey, motherfucker? Because I'm from the Dirty Jersey, too. Where are you at? I didn't know that. Belmar. Belmar. All right, man. I dated a girl from Belmar once for like three weeks, but okay. she was, I was down South Jersey more and she, uh, she was down where I was for a little while. And then like, she like moved to Belmar and I was like, Oh, this is going to work. You know? Yeah, of course. Of course it will work. Cause it was like, you know, we were 16, 15 years old, no license, you know, we'll see each other, but no, I what, never saw it? her again. <laughs> that, 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 that's a typical Belmar girl right there. Love you and leave you. Uh, yeah, I never saw her again. I was like, man, God, she kissed me and then I fell in love and then never saw her again. <laughs> and she moved on. <laughs> she moved on. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Man, so you said go you ahead. lived down. Where did you live here? I lived right uh, half. I live in a little town right outside of Vineland called Franklinville. Sure. Yep. Yep. Know? I know. Yep. That's a. Uh, 
kind of southwestern Jersey a little bit. Yeah, from yeah. Uh, I went. I went to Delsey High School. So. Okay. How about that, man? Yeah, man. We've known each other all this time, and we didn't know that we were both from Jersey. That's fucked up. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy yeah, how that, that is- happens. Well, that explains why I like you, though. There's, there's a <laughs> special, right, about you know being an East Coaster, especially a Jersey guy. You know, and especially ones that get out. You know, like you you see it a little bit. Like you get out for a little bit. You know, yep. everyone else in the whole world. If you're not from like that area, like that 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 uh, Eastern Eastern Pennsylvania, New York City, Jersey area, everyone gets so scared of the word fuck. Yeah, and it's- I don't understand it everywhere else. Like, man, I'm I just said fuck. What's the big deal? What's the big it, and fuck? Actually, it sounds nice. Yeah. It's a nice addition to a well constructed sentence. Yeah, I don't. I don't trust anybody that doesn't curse well. Yeah, you know, I, I went through my own beginning of the year. I went through my own little. All right, because I was, you know, I, I, I curse a lot. Okay. And you, you, you too. You know how it is. I'm like, let me clean it up a little bit. Try and try and go PG thirteen here. Try and sweep in a, a larger demograph. And I did it for two months. And I said, you know what? Fuck this. <laughs> fuck it's this. not you, man. Right? It's no, just not, not you. I'd rather be authentic. I'd rather be authentic as fuck. And like you either like me or like, you know, if you don't, if you can't handle it, then fine. You're not my audience. You, you know, this message is not for you. It's not for you. I don't know what to tell you. It's just not for you. Yep. And I, I did try and like, I, I did soften it a little bit because I was, it was too like in gym and you know, the gym conversation, uh-huh, gym uh-huh. language as compared to like sitting in the cafe language. Sure. Different. So I was like, let me like I'm sitting with my buddies in the cafe instead of sitting with my buddies on the mat after a hard session. Right. So that's the mentality of when I do speak publicly. It's cafe talk. Cafe. Right. fuck. Yes. It, it, you, you can't just come right out with the fuck. You, you yeah. have to like ease into it. They have to feel you a little bit and then you can drop it. You know, absolutely. Yes. yes what yes. I don't agree with, though, like my so uh, we my wife and I met with my son. Um, uh, I'm a big proponent of therapy. Um, we met with my son's therapist and she thinks and, and I totally disagree with her here. And, and that um, that a kid should be able to say fuck you to his parent at some point, like literally those words. And I was like and like I, I was like, what? You know, like, hold on here. I don't I've, ne- I've never said fuck you to my parents. And I don't think I've ever said fuck you to anybody that I wasn't willing to fight. No, you're right. Right? Fuck you is we're fighting. Yes, we're fighting. Like if I look at you and say, you know what, man, fuck you, then it, we might have to – we're going to throw down. Like, the, yeah. like I, am, I am down to cross that bridge of throwing down. Yeah. And fuck you is the level of – I do not respect you. Yes. Fuck you, you fucking piece of shit. Yes. Yeah. Should should be able to say, like, mom, like, you frustrate me so much right now. Like, I just really disagree with this, but I respect you because – you're my mom. This you're, is your house. You yeah. pay for my school. That, and that, that's the more the, the line of thought. Did you tell your therapist, fuck you? No, uh, no, because I respect the lady and, I, and I'm going to talk to her. It's not mine. It's my kids. You know, so the next time I see her, I'm like, look, I'm not going to tell you fuck you. That's exactly was my line of thought. Yes, yeah. because I respect you. I respect your opinion. I think that opinion of yours is, I'm going to say fuck now, absolutely fucking stupid. Yeah. But I'm not saying fuck you. Yeah. It's That's a huge, there's a huge difference there. And we should be teaching our children that there's boundaries, there's etiquette, there's decorum. Even yeah. in my mind, I might be saying, fuck you. But that's like, I'm not going to whip my dick out because no. I got it in public. Yeah. There's decorum here, right? I yeah. can piss in the bushes just fine. I'm going to walk another, you know, half mile and uh-huh. use the restroom. That's a great fucking point. You have, to know, you have to know your audience. You have to know where you are. Yep. Right? There's, and there's, like, there's, yeah. There's so- man come on like we got some rules of engagement here and that's the biggest problem right now is no one no one understood the, like our rules are all fucked up they are right Fuck our rules up. are all fucked up the things that the things that one we can say to people and two that people get offended by it's like on both ends of the goddamn spectrum right it's you're just like no one no one's playing with the same rules no and that's that's bullshit and it's what is allowed to be said is is mind-blowing but what gets banned or restricted from the public conversation makes no sense yeah. and i'm very much you know i'm, I'm apolitical let's say I'm, I'm a health and fitness dude and and whatever that means so i don't get involved in the left and right free speech advocate everybody should be able to talk and then once we hear what the fuck these idiots have to say we should be able to ostracize them from our um from a a a sphere of influence over our lives you don't agree with the red guy or or the the blue guy 
then just don't listen to the motherfucker anymore. Don't tell them to shut up. Don't ban them from speaking at public campuses or don't, you know, kick them out of going to a fucking Chick-fil-A or whatever the conversation is. Yeah. They can say what the fuck they want to say. But if they're an idiot, then we all know they're a fucking idiot and no one's going to pay attention to them anyway. Now, I that, do. I do agree with no preaching hate. Like you can't go around saying you're going to kill people. No, that's de- that's inciting violence. Right. Yes. You cannot right. incite violence. Exactly. Agree. But if you want to go around talking about like, uh, I don't know, like the sun's not going to come up tomorrow. Have the fuck at it, man. Sure. Have the fuck at it. You know, go ahead. See how far that gets you. Yeah. And it's like the flat earthers yeah. or keto advocates. <laughs> <laughs> they're all fucking idiots. <laughs> they, they're, they're all bullshit. I'm you know, obviously I'm, I'm having a little fun here. Yeah, I, I mean I want them thrown in jail or banned from fucking Twitter because they're not eating carbs anymore. Right? They should be able to spout their bullshit. I yeah you ha- yeah go ahead. Uh, if go you're on. not hurting anybody, you know, if you're not screaming hate talk, you know, like if you're not saying go kill the blacks and the Jews and the gays, then man, you know. Or, or the white guy, whoever, like, you know, the, yeah. the, the two bald white guys on the phone right now. Well, I guess I'm half white, you know, the two yeah. bald guys, you know, um, if you're not saying that, then man, go ahead, go ahead, say whatever the fuck you want. But at some point we, as like a society have to say, um, yeah, that's bullshit. And we're, we're having real hard times right now calling bullshit on people. I think it's because everyone's scared to speak up because we see how aggressive the op position is with the expression of free speech so you see you know how people are attacked for expressing their opinion which might be contrary to the ruling power at that time and when i say ruling power i don't mean the trump white house ruling power i mean the ruling power on the medium with which you're expressing yourself the rule there's a ruling power on twitter a ruling power on reddit a ruling right, power right right on youtube and they're all a little bit different so people then they're they're scared to talk for fear of of you know repercussions from the ruling power in that audience. So that's why people are being quiet. But now that they're quiet, it allows that that ruling power to get stronger and just continue to bulldoze the narrative. And that's where things get scary. And this goes back to our right to free speech and what the nation was founded on. And by the way, I will virtue signal here. I am also not a full fledged white guy. I am, I am Native American. I'm Chickasaw Indian. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. So two so two half two two fucking mulattoes. Just mulattoes. Mi- two mixed up mother bald motherfucking bald guys. And how much more American is that, right? You know, it's the my most American thing. Father was my grandparents on my dad's side. They they actually went through Ellis Island from Italy. My father was born in the United States. His older siblings were born in Italy. So he's a, a first born American. And then, you know, met my mom who, who her dad grew up on an Indian reservation and her mom came over from Scotland. You know, so it's that's very American right there. And, and I'm, I'm an American before anything like the, the last name is Dolce. So people think, well, you're an Italian guy. Well, eh, not really. No, I really know my dad. That yeah. Much. You know, he was gone by the time I was eight. Grew up in my, Amer- you know, Irish, Catholic, Scottish, native fucking crazy <laughs> household. I'm an American motherfucker like that. That's how we define ourselves. And we just get so stupid about what American is like. Like, you know, you have this one side screaming off. If you're an American, you're you're a flag swinging Budweiser drinking uh, yeah. gun supporter. And no, if you're an American, you're over here doing this. No, man, you, I'm as American as fuck. And, Absolutely. you know, and, and I and we just we got to get away. We got to. It's two things, in my opinion. One, we got to get away from the. Okay, uh, my color is blue, therefore I stand for all of these things. And my color is red, so I stand for all of these things. Come on, man. That's stupid. stupid. That's stupid. And what that now ties into is like we can't take like a person's couple good ideas and say, oh, yeah, I like that, but I don't like this that he does. Yep. You know? Like, like you don't know anybody who's like middle ground on Jordan Peterson. You either have to love the guy or fucking hate the guy. I, I'm middle ground. I can't fucking tell. I can't, you know, and I'm okay with that. Because, like, his rule number six, have you read his book, 12 Rules for Life? I haven't read his book. I've, I've you know, uh, uh, I have a, a, a knowledge base from YouTube and Instagram, you right. know, one videos of Jordan. He's got, and not to hijack your point, yeah, he's got some great stuff. And yeah. then he's got some bullshit, I think. Bullshit. Just and utter that- bullshit. And he's a and he, that's 
his right. I'm not going to agree with yeah. anything my wife fucking says. Why am I going to agree with everything Jordan Peterson says? I don't agree with me. <laughs> right? You, I don't agree with me all the time. I'm fucking over there doing it, and I'm like, oh, God damn, this is fucking dumb. Why am I doing this? <laughs> right? That's, yeah. You know? That's all. How the fuck yep. am I doing this, man? And then you go, I'm not going to do that again. That was stupid. But, but like, for some reason, like, you know, like his his rule number six, in my opinion, is the best rule, and and it's what we all need to do. Get your you get your house in order before you criticize the world. Yeah, right. That's it. That's it. Like that's, that's it. an amazing rule. You know, use it. Everyone yep. should use it. Everyone should use it. But for some reason, if you hate Jordan Peterson, you like can't use that fucking rule. And that's the stupidest fucking thing because it's like there's so many of those because the rules are the easy things. And he wrote that book, The 12 Rules of whatever it is. Right. I forget the name of the book. But that's – I'm an author. I'm, I'm in that, that genre. Me too. Right? Me too. I, right now, health and fitness world. And it's – that people love – easy to digest bullet points. Mm-hmm. I want a top 10. I want a, a one through five. I want the three easy ways to firm your belly. That is that is the clickable bait. That's the way things work. And when Jordan did that, I'm sure he just aggregated thousands of, of concepts. Seven of minute so- abs, bro. Seven minute abs, bro. Three minute abs. Yeah. Homie. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <I guess>. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's just an aggregation of best practices. Yeah. There's, so not, and I'm not bagging on him saying that he's not a smart guy. Obviously, he's a smart guy. But his book, that's just an easy to digest, you know, sellable commodity that he can put into the public and make some money and, you know, help some people. But I think a lot of the things that he talks about that I like from Jordan Peterson is personal accountability. Mm-hmm. And yes. that's, that's my big takeaway. Personal accountability. You're responsible for it. We're all fucked up. You got to go about the way of fixing it. So clean your room, make your bed, get your house in order, brush your hair, take a shower, like be on time. How can you get mad at that shit? And then when he goes in and gets into the whole pronoun thing, you can actually I I listen to those arguments and you understand the points. I'm not going to state my own, you know, philosophy here because I don't think anyone cares what a nutrition guy thinks about that shit. We're not smart enough. We don't we don't have we don't have like the, the, the 10 letters behind our name. Nobody no, cares. <laughs> I got people in my family. Yeah. I have people in my family. So it very closely affects my family. And even inside our own family, there's a robust but respectful debate on like what terms should be used at the next family party and what what level, how deeply into the process is this individual? I don't want to blow anyone's spot here. And it's like right. everyone's nobody knows like each season what to say, what to do, like how has it changed? Sure. And that becomes very uncomfortable instead of just being like, yo, what's up? What's up? Yeah. What's up? But just ask them. Just ask. Just talk. Just talk. What's up? Just talk. What do you want? That becomes the issue. Yeah. Just forget about all the bullshit and let's just have a good time. Smoke a joint. Let's just talk. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Like, can't we just do that again? Uh huh. Like, man, I've never. If 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 somebody walks up to me and asks me to call them like Steve, but their name is Dan, I'll call him fucking Steve. I don't give a fuck. Agreed. You know. But if you like. Pass a law that I have to that says I have to call every Dan Steve. Now we get, you get just like his point there. I thought was really good. He was like, "Look, I've never not called a student what they wanted to call with me to call them." You know, out, uh, out of respect, to out the of respect individual. to the individual. But you have to have a fucking conversation. Yep. You know, I can't. You, you have to. You have to talk to each other. We just don't like to talk to each other. We all have those friends where, like, I mean, they're hilarious on social media, right? But then the second you sit down with them, they they cannot speak. And you look at them and you're like, "Yo, dude, you are fucking so funny. What happened? Where are you?" And yeah. they just can't. They can't have actual person to person human interaction. That's a good point, and a lot of people seem to be afflicted with that. Yeah. They- know how to engage and especially because of social media they don't know how to engage one-on-one and have a deeper conversation other than hi what are you doing nothing what are you playing Fortnite? yeah how you doing well you want to go do jujitsu and then you do jujitsu but you don't talk afterwards like the best uh, i think you know for me the best part of martial arts is like the martial art is cool i like it i really really like it but it's like the camaraderie right for, for me, it's the community. Like, Easton's whole thing, man, is the community. Like, yeah, sure, we do some chokes and arm bars and heel hooks and take the back and shit. You know, it's, it's amazing. And we, we beat each other up and talk some shit. But then afterwards, it's like the 
it's the sitting around. It's the hanging with your homies, even at like almost 40. You know, yeah. it, it's still the hanging with my homies. I just hang with my homies all day. At the jujitsu, that becomes the common bond that unifies people from all walks of life. You get the vegan tree hugging hippie. You get the, the meat eating hunter carnivore. You get the police officer. You get the kid that's been in trouble with the law all the time. But when they meet inside the martial arts, inside the dojo on the mats, that's the leveling factor. That's the common ground. And then you can just sit back and hang with your homies. Yeah. Where on the street, that becomes harder because you see someone and, well, fuck, man, that's not the way I dress. That's not the way I look. That's not the car, car I drive. We have nothing in common. Only to find out that, yeah, motherfucker, you had a shit ton in common. And that's – I agree with you. That's – you know, at this stage, I'm 42 now. At this stage of life, that's the beauty of the martial arts. And, and you know, Dwayne and I, uh, Professor Ludwig yeah. and I talk about how we miss the old days, the early 2000s of MMA when it was so simple because it was all camaraderie. It was all grind. It was no money and social media. It was all, and, and you, of course, you know, you were in there and you know, there was, there was a crew of people in those early 2000s, the kind of like the pre tough, like the early tough one through five, maybe error uh -huh. of guys and gals that were on the match training for no notoriety. Right. And we miss I missed those days, the simplicity of the martial arts back in those days and of the grind back in those days and the camaraderie. Those are my I mean, we go back to those early days, right? The early, you know, sing 2000, maybe six, seven, six, six, six and seven. Yeah. 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 That's where we go back to. And that's and tough one came out in 2005. So it's right in that phase. That was the golden era of, of MMA, in my opinion. Um, the golden. Yeah, it was it was amazing. You know, I think, so I hate MMA, <laughs> you know, Buddy, I, I hate, I hate, shit. yeah, I hate MMA. I love my guys, you know, that I, that I still have, that we still have, we still have a solid team out here, you know, Absolutely. Um, but we do it a little different, you know, we, we do it a little different. Like there's, there's 30, 40 guys on the team. I have three, four, you know, each, each coach does their thing with their guy you know, as a team. And so, it, you know, we, we re we've really, I think, done a decent job of like taking that like money, like, and that's, that's what kills MMA, especially teams, right? Is money is you have one coach who's, whose gym it is at the top needing to make all the money. Yeah. Right. So for us, we've gotten away from that, you know, um, we, uh, so that that's worked really well. So I, I, the only part about MMA I really like is my guys. You know, like the like going to practice and all that stuff because we, we have that and like none of the coaches are ever arguing about money. Um, we all have our own schools and do our own thing so that like this money thing is like like we get to just coach for fun. That's it. You know, we get I get to coach, coach the, the guys that the guy. I love, you know. And you're in it because now you're on the journey, their life's journey. Mm -hmm. It just happens to pass through the world of MMA for a few years, but it's a larger journey. It's a larger it's journey. A We're trying to make better people. Like it. I sat down, I sat down with Drew Dober last week, you know, and I was like, man, like, uh, I ha we got to have a talk. Let's, we got to have a talk about your finances, man. You know, Ooh. cause I felt like that, like we're, we're not being smart, you know? And, and like, look, let's be clear. I, you know, I said to him. I was like, you're not paying, like he came with a check to pay me for his last fight. I was like, nah, man, that ain't happening. He's like, what do you mean? Like you, you, you coached really hard. I'm the one who fucked up, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't take money when my guys get submitted. Ooh. You know, I was like, so you, you, you know, even when it's not my, even though like, yeah, for sure. I mean, he totally admitted like, whoa, man, this was, I blew this, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah that's cool. You know, but we blew this, you know, like. So somewhere along the line, I fucked up and maybe I fucked up by not having this like, oh, sh this, this talk that we're about to have right now before the fight, yeah. you know, because I'm not here just to coach you in jujitsu, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. here to like to, to help, you know, help guide you through life. You're younger than me. I had somebody guide me through life at this age. So fuck, mm -hmm. I didn't do a good job. And that's what these young kids need. And I like Drew Dober. I've been a fan of his for a long time. And, yeah, man. and it's funny. I don't, we don't know each other very well, but we gravitate towards each other fight week when we see each other. And we always carve out a few minutes to just chat it up. And I, so I follow him in his career with, while not, have, not working with him. And I saw some of the articles that came out about him and the way he was talking. And he was talking more about the business side. And he's got a new agent now. And I'm not bagging on anybody. Right. But 
that I, and this is just me being in the game for fucking 20 plus years now. I started this shit in the late 90s with Team Henzo up in New York and all the satellite schools in those early days. So I've been around it since the Pancrase days as a friend, teammate, coach and all that other shit. And I, was, it, I just felt my gut. I was like, ooh, Dober's not – his mind isn't where I felt it should be because he felt like – he felt like he wasn't getting his just due. He felt like he wasn't getting paid the way he needed to. Now he's talking about getting, jumping up a pay tier to bigger opponents, which I get and understand, but he's got a tough fucking dude in front of him right now. Has that blurred his focus? And I don't know. I'm just kind of, this is me just being a From fan. From the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From an outside, like, ooh, this is not what I want to see an athlete saying. So saying you had a conversation with him about, you know, money and getting his, his goals right. And he got submitted by a guy that probably shouldn't have submitted Drew if Drew was fucking mentally focused, locked in. We all get caught. I mean, every shit happens. Get, shit happens. Shit happens, of course. But per percent, and he's working with you and, and your team and all that stuff. So that's just kind of me saying, fuck. And I agree, and I'll, I'll just kind of you know close with Mursad Bektik. I started working with Mursad Bektik, man, six years ago, his fourth fight ever. I, I'm with him to this day. He gets in the UFC, starts fighting the UFC. Mursad Bektik is the guy. He sends me a check. on. He fights on Saturday. A check is in the mail on Monday. I send the check back to him. Now, I charge. Everybody has to pay me. He sent a check to me. Then I cut him a check for my business right back to him with the caveat that he has to put this into a Roth IRA for himself. Oh, uh, yeah. That's the, talk, that's the talk we had. I was like, look, man, I need you to go read this book. Okay. And then you need to set this up. That's it, brother. And that's, yep. that's what's different about guys like you, guys like me. We're looking out for these young men because we know the career ends. It, and then And then what? And then what? Because for get, for me, man, like like when we when we when we break down the nuts and bolts of it, fuck, dude, I was walking through a mall, through a mall, in Boulder, Colorado, when I met a mall. Oh wow! I just happened to be there, and he happened to be there. Yep. And then look, it, it provided the opportunity for me to work really, really hard. Yep. You know, I it provided the opportunity for me to work really hard, but I had nothing to do with that. You know, I just, my, my buddies were like, Hey, let's go to the mall, <laughs> you know? And, ah, sure. Let's go to the fucking mall. Yeah. You know? So, and, and then the person that a mall is, I just did a podcast with them all. My last podcast that came out was called a mall. We have, we have this verb, man. It's called a mall link. Uh, and, um, I created it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a language creator. I, I see that. I like that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, he just, he just has this way about him where he creates opportunity for people. Yeah. You know, he creates massive opportunity for people. And um, so, like, I didn't have anything to do with with that. Like, sure, I was ready to hear the message and yada, yada. And then, and then look, I'm not I'm not trying to discredit my really, really, really hard work or anybody's really, really, really hard work. But there's this aspect of luck that's in there. You know, there's this aspect of like fate, if you want to call it, or yeah. some people like to call, say it's God, you know, I'm not a religious person. Some people like to say God's in control, whatever you want to call that thing. We, we don't really have much to do with that thing. So like our job, in my opinion, is to sprinkle that luck dust on other people, you know, so that that's my job in the world. Just go out there and sprinkle the dust on as yeah. many people as I can. And, and, and you know what? Most people, it doesn't work for. You know, Most people don't. Maybe I could have done the message better. Maybe this or maybe that. So I'll try again. And you just, sprink, and you know, you just, you just keep sprinkling dust. And, you know? and, if it, and sometimes, it ca sometimes that dust turns into gold. The problem with opportunity is it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Yeah. That's paraphrasing a quote from someone smarter than I. But that's the truth. And I remember I read that when I was at teenager late teenager and it struck me it's work and what you're saying a mall was there the opportunity was there but had you not put on the overalls and went about the task of fucking working bleeding and sweating tirelessly in many days thanklessly you wouldn't have achieved the success you've achieved and now you're able to share those opportunities with those that you can influence around you and that's it's rare that's it. that will actually see it and take advantage of it, man. No matter how much you scream and I scream and, and people try and scream to get, you know, those junior members of the community to, to see this and take advantage. And when I say junior, I don't mean by age, just by experience or by their level. 
They just don't grasp onto it because they get pulled back into the apathy of of pop culture and of life. And kind of how we started off your show is the 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 social media trends and getting locked into like the digital world and, and be becoming unplugged from the reality of life. They get this false reality of, of, of digital reality, which is completely false. They get pulled into that and other ways and they blame their parents. They blame their upbringing. They blame their, their job, their wife. They, oh, they blame everything, not realizing that it, it's completely internal. All of your success, all of your failure is completely your fault. Yes. I don't like to take credit for my success. It keeps it, that that puts me in a bad place. It doesn't keep me humble. I like I like uh, I like to like uh, yeah, but my failures are always my fault. Even when I don't even do it, you know. Even when it's not like even when like God, what was it? We we oh, I know what it was. Yesterday we were like we had this situation where we let like somebody else handle. You know, uh, we have a CEO of Easton, Mike. You know, Mike's the man. Sure. Um, and Mike and I were talking about a situation and we just like, we, we, did, we let someone else handle it. And we were like, yeah, yeah, they fucking got it, you know? And it wasn't a big situation. It was really nothing. And then it turned into something, you know? And it wasn't, it wasn't even like my failure, but it, it, was the, it was the non-action. It was like the, I fucking know better, right? I know better than to let that person handle it, you know? Yeah. Because na- now, now look at the fucking mess we got. Yeah. Right now, look at the fucking mess we got rather than like walk through with that person, how they're going to handle it. So we can we can do that better, you know, like just so that the next time that a situation like this comes up for me and my company, you know, we like I don't have now, now I'm stuck doing some bullshit I don't like to do. And like I can get as mad as I want about the person who dropped the ball. Right now, I can, you can make a decision whether, you know, if they drop the ball enough, you're going to fire them or yada, yada, you know, obviously. But I always see that as like, God damn, I didn't, I didn't spread that message right. You know, I didn't spread that message right. And oh, now it like, look, if I, if I change my message and they don't alter, sure, they're going to get fucking fired. <laughs> you know, but I haven't had that. We haven't had that too much. I have to say, you know, we really haven't. And everyone like, man, trust me, my company is filled with millennials, filled with it. It's all that it's like, I think I'm all, I'm all and I are the oldest guys. And then everyone else is a goddamn millennial. Mm, Valor's not a millennial. He's a little older than me. Um, but it's, it's three dudes that aren't millennials and then millennials and they yeah. crush it for us, bro. They fucking crush it because they understand what the purpose of Easton is, you know? That's, and that comes from the top down. That's that from the leadership. Yep. You know? And if you like, I'm about to, uh, we're, we're releasing, I'm, I'm making a digital course on how to like run your, we call them, you know, we don't even call them front desk employees because I don't, we don't like that term, you know? Um, because a front desk person, like, I don't know, that's just a job that you like go do sometimes. Right. Sure. Like, like, but that's not what we do. I don't, I don't like people quitting. Like, that's not my thing. You know, that's not our thing. Like we want you to go from the front desk to the GM somehow. Yeah, I you love know, it. like that's what we want. So we're we're creating this front desk. You know, well, I'll call it front desk because that's what everyone understands. But we call them first impression. You know, because that's what it is. You're the first, like every single person that 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 comes into the school. The first people they talk to is a front desk employee. So yeah. how in the world can that be a shitty employee? Yep. Right? How in the they, world can that be a shitty employee? You know, yeah. if you they walk, have- if you walk, there's like the the best restaurant in the world. What's your favorite restaurant? Oh, my kitchen. Okay, a restaurant, though. Yeah, okay. When you walk into your kitchen, right? Yep. And let's say your kitchen, you know, is a fucking mess, right? Like you, let's just say, let's just say you walk in, somebody else, you, you went away for a month, right? You come back, you let your buddy stay in your kitchen, and you are so stoked to fucking cook a meal. If that kitchen's a mess, you can't cook a meal. Yes, yes. You got to clean. You got to, like, and if your buddy ain't there, if your buddy bounced to, like, Australia or some shit... Fuck, man, you're cleaning the goddamn kitchen. You might get mad at him, right? <laughs> like, yo, dude, what the fuck? You know? But you're going to clean the well, kitchen first. You're going to make that kitchen look nice, and then you're going to cook a meal. Yep. Right? Absolutely. There's no homeless dude at the, at the fucking greeting table of, a, of, a, of the, a phenomenal restaurant. No, that's a good point. It's usually someone that's well-dressed, good-looking, attractive. They know the menu. They know the, they, they know the layout. They know how to treat people. So why don't we do that with our martial arts schools? 
That is true. That is true. Usually you see a lot of gyms, we'll just say martial yeah. arts schools or fitness centers, they do just have that minimum wage employee that's just there trying to squeak out there 24 and a half hours a week. Yep. Right. They got other things to do. They're probably half high. You know, they're just waiting to go to their other job, washing cars or, you know, whatever it is. And they're they're not in. They're not a part of the culture. They're not you're, a part of the culture. You're, you're, get on, man. That person has to embody the culture. Because because the culture's hard, man. Right. This culture's hard. You're gonna come in here and you're, we're gonna. You're, I'm gonna get beat up. Yep. People are gonna punch and kick me, and I'm gonna get all sweaty. And it's the, the the moves are actually very difficult to do. Right. Even if you're just coming in for a kickboxing class, all on the bag, it's still, it's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not easy and it's super intimidating because you walk in, like when you walk in the school, man, there's fucking like Alistair Overeem and Curtis Blades and Neil Magny and you're like, whoa, whoa, what the fuck did I, and you know, and there's pictures on the wall of Shane Carwin breaking someone's face, right? Or, or you know, whatever school you're walking into. Yeah. You know, like there, but this is every school just about, and there's, you see dudes and girls sweating and their geese are all over the place, like whatever it is, it's fucking intimidating. Yep. So how do what how do we how do we get that person in the door? Because we know what it does for the human soul, right? Absolutely. I'm not that tough. I'm a fucking pussy, and look what it did for me. Well, I, I I would I would disagree with that, but okay, okay, I I see your point. Continue. You know, you can you can change a person's life, even if they don't fight in the UFC. You know, they don't need to fight in the UFC. You can change their life. No, that's the truth. Through martial arts, it's through the journey, it's through the self realization, the constant work on oneself it's, it's self-mastery that's what martial arts are and that comes through the challenges that we face on the mat you know hopefully you don't have to line up with alistair Overeem. yeah no, of <laughs> course day. not of course not no there right you know it takes a while but he started one day as a white belt also as an insecure person just like everyone else everyone else slowly had to earn his way through yep. it's a metaphor for life i saw i saw a quote from uh i don't know a joe rogan meme the other day um that was like, you know, like uh, the process of getting good at something that's really, really hard, like jujitsu, is amazing. Like what it does for the person. Sure. You know, that's just, it's so like, just like what that does to a person when you have to get good at something that's really fucking hard. Yeah. You know, like it sucks, man. But at the end of the suck is, is beauty. You know? Yeah. And it, it, and it shouldn't be available to those who don't go through the suck. Yeah. Because it's diluted and it wouldn't be worthwhile, right? Because if anyone could have it or attain it, well, who fucking cares? It's cares. not that special. Yeah. But but it's attainable by everyone. Absolutely. Right? Like the, the prerequisite is the door. And that's it. <laughs> like, like the only barrier of entry is the door. Everyone, come on. Come on the train. You know? Yep. Come on the train. Like you, you can sit in the front, the back, the middle. It don't fucking matter. But if you keep coming on the train, wherever you're sitting, you're going to go on the ride of your life. You know, you're going to yeah. go on the ride of your life and, and nothing else matters. Your money, your car, your, 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 the, the, the beauty or the beauty of your wife, how great your kid, it doesn't matter. The mat is all that tells the truth. Yep. That's the truth, my man. So let's get back to like just some particulars, man. Like how did you like, so, I mean, you crushed it, the Dolce diet, you know, oh. like, and you said you moved, you've moved out of MMA, but how did you get into MMA? So MMA, I, I started, you know, let's go back. It's funny because I, I just came back from Missouri to see my old high school wrestling coach. And, and in many ways, he got me, he helped shape me. And, you know, he is, he said, because years later, 2008, I was on the Ultimate Fighter season seven as a contestant. And he just, one of his buddy calls and he said, do you see what Dolce is doing? And he's like, no, because we lost track. I graduated high school in 94. Now it's 2008, 14 years later. He turns on the TV and he sees me out there fighting. And he's like, fuck, I failed this kid. I <laughs> failed this kid. I was trying to teach him how to be a man and how to go through life. And now he has to go out there and he has to go and bleed just to make a living. And because he's, he's not a, a, he's more of a purist. He's a wrestling fan, old school wrestling fan and a boxing fan, but not much boxing at like 80s boxing, early 90s boxing. And then when boxing kind of died in many ways, he, he, he left it. And this is, you know, his own words. So then he sees me out there fighting. He's like, fuck, like, what did I do? And then, you know, years later, he's watching uh, one of Kevin, Kevin James's TV shows. And Kevin James walks out and he's wearing a Dolce Diet T-shirt. And he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> so then he goes, he like Googles me and he's like, holy shit, like 
it worked out for this kid. Like, what the fuck happened? So I, I, I sit down and, you know, and we're having this conversation. So it goes back um, high school wrestling, right? I was a four year varsity wrestler um, in high school from, you know, freshman all the way through senior. And as a freshman, I was actually made um, voted on to be captain. So that's very rare in that world. And that was only because I led it. I was the fittest guy on the team. I was one of the strongest and I was one of the smallest. I started at 125. But I was in better shape than anyone. I knew more than everyone because when I was eight years old, I saw my father have a massive stroke and heart attack, was taken from the house. I became the man of the house. I grew up in abject poverty. We had no heat, no electricity, no running water. So you watched that for your dad? I watched it. I I came home from school and he's laying on my back deck, puke all over him. My mom's running from the garden up the stairs to call 911. Ambulance. My neighbor was a – thank God my neighbor – was a policeman. He's the first one on the scene, tried to stabilize him. And it was just, it was, and I just remember a whirlwind of sirens and faces. And, and then I'm bouncing homes, living in with aunts and uncles because they're trying to get everything settled. And it was just chaos. So I grew up like for, you know, six months to a year in hospitals, watching my father just slowly fade away. Massive stroke, heart attack. He succumbed to the heart attack after the stroke, yada, yada. And my mom, single mom, stay at home mom, she was now forced to work. She's cleaning houses. She's, you know, working, you know, three, four menial, like sub minimum wage jobs just to try and keep things going. And me at eight years old, I'm completely left on my own in many ways. The man of the house, if you will, where there's, you know, we had a fireplace in the house, thank God, and bitter cold northeast winters, there's no heat in the house. And I used to go in and like rummage and, and salvage around the neighborhood looking for wood and pallets that I would drag home just to keep like the fire going at night. So we had a little bit of heat. So I grew up with a work ethic, with a desire to be warm and to have food on my table and to succeed. Now I believe, and this is my, my armchair Freud because lost my father at an early age, I was looking for father figures and I found strength sports combat sports. I was enamored with, just like many kids, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Van Dams and the Sly Stallones. And and that was the, thank God, that was like the rage of the action hero movie genre at that age. I was infatuated with getting bigger and stronger because that would be my salvation. If I could get big and strong, then I would be a tough badass. I would, I would live the life that I wanted to eight, nine, 10 years old. I was enamored with it. Now I was working in earnest. I, I, I got a job working on a I live on on the beach and we have a, a robust marina charter fishing boats. So at eight years old, I needed money. I went Hold up to on. The- let's back up for a second. Let's, let's, let's clear something up. When you say you live on the beach, you live on the beach of Belmar, New Jersey. This isn't yeah. like the beach of Santa Monica, California. No. Okay. No, this, this is a Bruce Springsteen song at oh, that yeah. time. Yeah, okay, per- yeah, we just got to clear that up. Everyone's like, man, that don't sound terrible. You're in Santa Monica. Uh, yeah, you're on the beach, baby. No, uh-uh. no, it's not Santa uh-uh. Monica. Is a blue collar run down town. Yes. Um, half the town is is like summer rentals and and the homes are just literally boarded up. But, it yes. was a beach town, but it had seen better days and it was a dying community. It, it really was. There's like most cars are like beat up pickup trucks. It was very blue collar. Um, handyman construction. It was laborers. It was There's a blue- beach there. There's a beach There's there. There's a beach there. And but we're a run down town on the beach. That, everyone's not driving down down the street in their Beamer though. No, no. Yeah. We survived only because of the summer influx. All right. the banks, the New Yorkers, people would come down for the summer. They would mob and destroy our town, and we'd be able to make money off of that. And like that everyone would- thinks the Jersey Shore is like the TV show. No, those people are from New York. They're right? New Yorkers. Yeah, they're New Yorkers. They're not, they're not from Jersey. They're, they're no. New Yorkers. They're, and even North – and I, I bust the people from North Jersey. North Jersey people, they're not real Jersey people. No, they're, they're New York. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're, right? yeah, exactly. So, we're the real. I mean, we're the we're the skateboarders. We're the surfers. You know, uh-huh. we're the the you know kind of the the real. We're the we're the blood of the earth down there, and so that's kind of how I grew up. And I, I started you know as, as a dock rat. The boats would come in at two thirty. I'd get off of school at two thirty. I'd run from school straight up to the docks, and I would help clean these boats, scrub the boats down, and they paid me a dollar an hour. Everyone well, you see working on the TV shows on at the Jersey Shore, those people are from New Jersey. We're from Jersey. Those that's are the Jersey people. Like, yeah, that's the Jersey Shore. Like yep. the, the people partying, New York. You, that's you, you know, like the people that's, working are Jersey. Or the, that's Jersey. That's our job. That's we got to we got to go home. Right. Yeah. You know, we don't know summer house. Um, so I'll, I'll fast forward through. So I have that work ethic. I'm always working. I'm always grinding, always making it happen. And then I have this. And I'm, I'm pretty 
I realized like, man, I got to get the fuck out of here. Once again, it's, it's a Bruce Springsteen song. I got to get the fuck out of here. How am I going to do that? I'm five foot four, 115 pounds going into freshman year of high school. I like playing. I was good at all the sports. But in high school, man, you're, you're playing against six foot kids in basketball. You're playing against, you know, 200 pound guys in, in baseball and soccer and all that stuff. They had a wrestling program that just started up one year prior to me getting in. Well, fuck, I'm going to wrestle then. So I went out there, I wrestled, I made the team not knowing anything I was doing, not knowing anything. The coaches saw talent in me, um, put me on the mat preseason. Um, I did rather well. I picked it up pretty quick. I was made the captain, so four-year varsity captain. And then from there, I became in charge of most of the conditioning. I would orchestrate the workouts. I would, I would really run the entire practice. I would lead from the front in many ways. And even the weight cuts, I was orchestrating at that time because the coaches had this old-school perspective. At least me, I was still as current as could be possible back then with modern knowledge of bodybuilding magazines. And then this is pre-internet. I would go to the library. I didn't party. I didn't have – I was a nerd. I was, I was a math geek and, and a, a science geek. I was honors math. I was honors sciences, all that stuff. I never did my homework. It was really easy for me for whatever reason. My brain was just wired like that. It makes sense now that I look back. But I was athletic too. I, I was so the I was, same way in college. Like I, I would show up to like the – the study sessions, like two two nights before before the test, and yep. and like and everyone would like teach me the whole thing, and then I'd be like, all right, sweet, and I'd go get like a, a B, and that was fine with me. Never went to class, never did my homework. I didn't even fuck. I wanted to change the jitsu, but yeah, I, I get that. It's funny because you say that. I realized I was like, well, I don't need fucking A pluses. I don't yeah. want to be like I don't want to be this honors bullshit anymore. I get it. I can do it. I just want to fly under the radar. I want to I want to work. I want to make my money. I don't want to fucking wrestle so I can get a scholarship and get the fuck out of here. I don't want to make it harder because I knew I was not gaming the system. I was working the system at that stage. There's no reason to be in honors for me. And I'm, you know, telling kids right now, there's no reason to if you can't. Great. Whatever. But you don't have to be. Hold on. If you want to if, if that's your thing, if your if thing is academia, which is great. Know God that like that's your thing. Then you need straight fucking ace. Right. Yeah. You need straight fucking A's. If you if your goal is Neil deGrasse Tyson, if like that's who you're looking at. Yeah. You got to get straight fucking A's. You better be reading and studying and gaining all the fucking information you can. That's right. Right. I agree. That's and it just depends on what your why is. Right. That, why do you exist? What are you here for? Now, look, you studied your fucking ass off, man. I'm looking at you wearing a shirt that says the Dolce diet. You can't fake that shit. I still right? I, every I, three hours a day and every day. Yeah. I'm you study. Every, you study your never, fucking ass off. Like never, you, yeah. But so it's not that you're not that. You just study this other thing over here. And man, it's a good point. I, I just did a, uh, a guest speaker at there, the, the, the keynote at the Fight Science Institute up in uh, Mineola, Long Island, okay. last month. And I said, I tell the audience that so we got fifty of the, the top coaches around the country. And I said, listen, uh, there's four PhDs and then me. So I'm not a PhD. I didn't do what they did. I didn't go through the academics that they did to get to this point. I said, but those of you who aren't on that path, I'm standing here right now alongside them. I respect them. There, there's, there's complete respect back and forth here. That wasn't my path because I am a shit student. Just like I'm a shit employee, which is why I own my own company. I own three companies right now. I employ PhDs. I employ RDs. I employ exercise physiologists. And I don't say that to be wise or to be, you know, busting balls. I say that because this was my path. I knew what my path was. And I say I'm a shit student because I don't want to sit in a class and be forced to learn something that I don't care about. That I've, doesn't. I have nightmares about it, bro. Wow. I have nightmares about it still. Like that, that, that I'm there, that I'm back in a classroom learning some yes. bullshit, bullshit that I don't want to work, that I don't want to do. That's just, but that's, again, that's just us. For that's some us. people, like, this other thing that we do might be bullshit, which is fine. Um, you're going to have a real hard time convincing me that, that um, exercise and, and jiu-jitsu is bullshit. Like, um, Never. Yeah, you, you, I don't think you'll be able to do it. Um, but, um, but, you know, like some people, like, like you find your why, right? Do, find, find it. Figure out what it is you love. Now, look, I get it. In the early stages, you got to expose kids to all kinds of shit. My kids hate art, you know? But, okay. like, they have to be exposed to it. Yeah. Right. You, you have to open the doors for them to, to see the world, art, music, this, that, you know, um, literature, like that's going to be some people's passions. So, so we have to have those avenues, but we also have to have these avenues for the kids that want to build shit for the kids that want to fucking like be entrepreneurs for the kids that want to be, you know, 
all about like exercise and science. You know, we have to open every door, not just the academic door. That's it. And it's, you talk about kids. I have two little girls. Most of what we do, their first exposure is to STEM products and curriculum in our house. The science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that's what we expose them to at a very early age. We expose them to languages that my wife and I don't have. We expose them to art. I mean, How we, old are your I, kids? Four years old. The oldest is four. The youngest is two. Okay. Okay. We're, and since they were born, we put them on that. Here's, here's a kazoo. Here's a harmonica. Here's a drums. Here's a piano. Um, here's, you know, art. Here's finger painting. Here's music. Here's, you know, here's Bach. Here's Vivaldi. Um, here's, um, you know, Alanis Morissette or just whatever it is We're constantly exposing them to that. And, and here's gymnastics and here's karate. And soon we'll get them into a, a, a jujitsu program over at, you know, Nick Catones. I, I think, you know, Nick, he's uh -huh, the uh -huh, closest, uh -huh. most reputable, um, a team in the area that we'll get him to, um, get them to. So it's, giving them this massive exposure at this age and then slowly as their minds form as, as they kind of find their proclivity of what they enjoy, then they'll start going down those tracks. Now, I didn't quite have that. My mom was too busy just trying to keep us alive, right? And I, I stumbled fortunately into my world of, of fitness and strength and I was able to use an entrepreneurial mindset that, you know, nature or nurture, I was forced into just by trying to keep the heat on and keep food on my table. And I was able to grow in this direction. But I think, you know me, I'm, I'm utterly passionate about it. It's all I think about really is, is this health, fitness, diet, nutrition, you know, sports performance, longevity. This is when people are going down the YouTube rabbit hole. That's what I do. I don't have Fortnite. I don't have games and apps. I don't do any yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Only thing like you, you probably the only thing I do is, is this is what I do. And then I, I speak with thousands of people every year on this exact topic. So my whole world is about this, just trying to help people get better. And then to, to kind of close loop. So I go through wrestling. I blow out my shoulder. I lose my scholarship. I can't compete. I take a year off. I stumble into a Henzo Gracie jiu-jitsu school. And inside that school is where I first fall in love with jujitsu and martial arts. And I was big. I was like 260 pounds at that point. I was a competitive power lifter. Some people you know, might know. Um, I was wrestling um, uh, over with uh, Damian Hahn, two-time NCAA Division I national champion. He had a school in the area. I was best friends with his cousin AJ when we were growing up. So I was able to work with guys like Damian at that level. I was able to you know, go in and enter a, a Henzo school. And then because of my background, and I, I opened my business in 1997 officially, as a strength coach slash personal trainer in those days, the Henzo guys started to hire me to help prep them. This is in the late 90s. And then those are in the Pancrase days. Those are in the Pride days. I mean, UFC was just kind of like nobody really cared about the U. It was all about Pancrase really. Mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it didn't exist yet. Yeah, it, it did. No, it did. It but, did. Not but it was right? banned. It was banned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody cared. It was like Asia. They were all going over to Asia. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. Abu Dhabi, you know, was was fucking big at that time. And um, Naga and Grappler's Quest. I was helping. Bayonne, New Jersey, bro. Bayonne, New Jersey. GQ. Right. Right? Shout out to Brian Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's that's where it took off. And then my reputation grew. And then I started getting phone calls. And then in the early 2000s, I got a phone call from Randy Couture. And because I had met some of the Team Quest guys in the early 2000s about coming out there to for three days to hang out with the team up at Team Quest. They were doing this seminar. They wanted me to come out. I go out there, meet them. And it was a they offered me a job to be their head strength coach. That's 2004. Now, 2004. And I, I took it. I, I took the job. So had, and a lot of people don't know. They're like, oh, this fucking Dolce guy. Like, I could do that. Like, motherfucker. You have no fucking clue what my story was to get to this point, to get hired by Team Quest in 04 was the number one fight team on the fucking planet. 100%. 100%. Right? And they hired, they chose me out of every other I would say it was, I would say it was between Team Quest, and uh, sh Shoot to Box. Yeah. You know? Uh, and probably uh, Sakuraba's team, right? Okay. And it's Pat but Miller to bust my balls. Oh, I Pat Miltic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's you like four or five of them, right? But five. you got you got to go a little international too because we know Japan was huge. So yep. let's say yeah, I would I would give you top five. It's somewhere top in five. the top five. 
And I'll point to Randy had the UFC light heavyweight belt. Hendo had the pride yes. welterweight belt, which he became champ champ. He had both belts. Right. Lin was considered the number one 85 pounder on the planet at the time. And he had a silver medal in Greco. Definitely um, a time when they would have been number one. That's that's the time. Yes. And it was it was at that time. That's when they chose me. That's when they hired me. And then from 04 to 09, I was the head strength coach of Team Quest North. During their glory days, their best days, this is pre-Tough One when they brought me in and all through the Ultimate Fighter One and multiple years forward um, that I was a part of that. And then, you know, 2008, I was uh, – because I had to fight to make money. There's no money as a strength coach and that's a whole other story that we won't get into. I, I got dicked on the money and I became the gym janitor. So for those of you who, you know, want to talk about opportunity, they, they, they were going to hire me to a salary of 32 k a year to be the head strength coach of the team. I get there. They say, yep. Oops, we don't have that salary, but we got a job at the gym for you. Four hours a day, $8 an hour. You can, quote, open the gym 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. I clean the dirtiest fucking gym on the planet. So $32 per day before taxes. I was the gym janitor, 5 to 9 a.m., 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. I coach 40 of the world's greatest athletes for free. That's how I got my start. So how did you start? That's how I got my start. I don't know any – most motherfuckers, probably you, probably Ludwig, would be willing to apply their passion for free for so long in order to help change the lives of these athletes that I knew I could do. But also I saw the big picture with my entrepreneurial mind knowing I was growing something here. I was creating a niche here that had never been done. There was like a Billy Rush before me, but Billy had a terrible reputation and we won't get into all that stuff. He was a little bit of a name over on the Militich side. Then he disappeared where our system continued to go on and grow. Then Rampage hired me as his strength coach because we met on the Ultimate Fighter um, that season seven. I mean, he hired me day one, the first day he met me, to be his head strength coach while he was my coach on the show. And then from there, I just continued to grow. Then moved out to, to Vegas in, in 2010 was hired by the UFC to create UFC Fit, which became an international phenomenon as the Dolce diet thing began to grow. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of bore you guys maybe with all the, the the different, you know, things that we've done since then. But that was the start, man. Very humble beginnings. And it was always about that blue collar, hard work, East Coast mentality as we continue to grow and scale forward. You know what I think about a lot, though, bro? And it drives me insane. What's that? Like, like your story, right? Dad die, you know, single mom. Like... Yeah. It's almost the formula sometimes for great success. Yeah. But but we know as far as like the percentages, it leads to just abject failure. Yeah. Yeah. Like so you're like, God damn, how could I how could I how could I make my kid probably the most successful? You know? <laughs> like if he's gonna reach the biggest heights, well, I gotta die. Or yeah, my but, wife does. You know? On but, shoulder. But, yep. but but then that like the likelihood that that happens. That they, that they reach the highest success, it's like 2% of like kids whose parents die, you know? Yeah. So like we, we know that 98% is going to be a shit show, yeah. right? right? Absolute shit show, welfare, fucking just, just continuing, continuing on the lines of poverty, yeah. right? But we know that there's this 2% of greatness. Like I don't know if I'd be willing to take that chance with my kid. No, they right? need, <laughs> yeah, of course they, they do. But do like, that. are they, you know, of course, you know, you never <laughs> do that. But like, you look at the greats, like all of the greats have this, like, you know, like this, this, like, oh my God, that fucking happened to you or most of the greats, you know? Yeah. Most do have that story. And me, it was in many ways, it still is. I got this fucking chip on my shoulder. I'm, I did a, a you know, London reel. If, if you know, um, Brian Rose, what he's doing over there with his London reel show, man, don't. it's, it's it's awesome. You should check it out. He's got amazing guests. Amazing. He's got like Rogan level guests on his show and it's a, it's a different format. And he, Brian's got a great interview style where he gets people to talk about things so casually that I had never spoken about before. And, you know, he was talking about me and all the things and he's like, what are you doing, man? Why are you still grinding? Like you've, you've made it in many and everyone defines. Oh God, I just put a video out about this. Tell, tell me in a second. Everyone oh, defines yeah. success differently. In my definition of success, like I don't need my own jet. I don't need certain things that a lot of people think will make them successful. You look at my Instagram, there's no there's no bling that's going on. I'm wearing Reebok shoes that I got for free six years ago, an eight dollar Carhartt hat. Right. I'm, that's that's kind of the, my life. But Brian, but I'm still fucking grinding, and you better believe I'm still fucking working and scaling this thing. And he says. Like, why are you still working so hard? You're over here in England. You're doing these seminars and all this shit. Like, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm just trying to keep the lights on. I feel every day like my lights are just about to get shut off. I still have that in my soul that I can't shake. 
Now, I know for a fact that ain't going to fucking happen. But I still that's the drive because of, of that kind of childhood trauma that drives me now to this day. And in many ways, this health and fitness thing is, is so paramount in my life. I talked to my, my, my wrestling coach about it this weekend. In many ways, I'm trying to save my father from dying and save the destructive element it had on the family, which is why I'm so passionate about this health and fitness and diet and lifestyle thing. Why else would I be so passionate about something? There was no money in this shit. Let me tell you. 10, 15, Hold on. There was years. no money in martial arts. Nothing. And, and I quit. Yeah, Go there ahead. was no money in martial arts 30 years ago. No. You, you could do okay, right? You could do okay. You know, but there was no like money, no real money. It's a side. It's a side. It's a hobby that pays for itself back in the early days. Uh huh. And I was willing and you were willing to go all in it went Ludwig too, because we've had these conversations. We weren't doing it for the money. We were doing it because there was a higher purpose. It just so happens entrepreneurial minded guys like us were able to turn a dollar doing it and were able to figure out that fucking part of it too, which to me, the more money I make only allows me to help more people. I mean, I sponsor for the youth programs out here in my hometown now. I'm, I'm, I'm completely philanthropic and altru Truistic. My wife and I, we started a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating childhood obesity and diabetes that we completely self-fund. So there's a lot of things now that we can do because we don't have to worry as much about paying the bills anymore. So, now we can really start to reach out and help change lives. So when you say like keep the lights on, you know, every like and I like so I'm in the same spot. My lights aren't getting shut off like in my house or my buildings or or, or my, you know, like my schools, like that, that's not happened. The lights that I'm trying to keep on are mine. Yeah. Like Ooh. my personal lights. Like I, you know, I wrote a book too. It's called, uh, the gospel of fire. And okay. it's about like, man, I, str I struggle with severe and a uh, severe anxiety, like, you know, crippling anxiety. So I know for me that the way to, to, to not, to, to keep myself from crying on the on the phone with my friends at three in the morning, because I'm like petrified in like the middle of a panic attack is to grind, you know, to grind at my passion, to grind at what I fucking love to, to just like, to go out and just fucking get it. And, and then, and then change people's lives the best I can, because that's what grinding is to me. I want as many people. So, so my goal is I had, you know, so during so, my, during my struggle, like when it was really bad three years ago, like, um, there's, Two, there was three people that like literally would stay up all fucking night with me on the phone. Like as I would just panic attack after panic attack after panic attack, you know? And I mean, for a month, I called these guys, these three guys every fucking night for a month. I'm, and then like, uh, like when I say up all night, dude, I would take two sleeping pills and a fucking Xanax. And my anxiety was so bad that shit would not put me to sleep sometimes. Holy shit, bro. Yeah, man. You know, so I wrote a book about this and how to like and just like my story a little, you know, and um, and how to get and how I mitigated it. Not that I know I'm right, but just how I did it, you know. So my goal with my life outside of like obviously my children, you know, is I need those guys to, to live a phenomenal life. Yep. Right. So I, I have to work until those guys live a phenomenal life, until those guys have my life. That That's my goal, you know, like till, till those guys have my life so that. And then, and then their goal is they have people under them. They got two people under them. They're like, okay, I got to get them to me, you know? And we just keep, we just, they, this is the grind, man. You know, this is the grind, but I fucking love the grind. You know, every day I, I, I don't like when I wake up in the morning, like I fucking meditate and then I get the fuck after it because I fucking love it. You know? And that's, I think that's the message is, is whatever you're going to do. I don't give a fuck what you're going to do. I don't think you do either, man. You know what? I don't care about what I, I don't care about. I, I, I cannot stay as disciplined as you do with diet. I can't, I love working out. I love working out. I'm not going to study it. I'm, I'm just not, but I love the mat, you know? So, so therefore my diet has to be 70, 70% good, 75% good. And I got to work out. I'm not into diet. Like you're into diet. You're probably not into jujitsu. Like I'm into jujitsu. It's cool, man. And look, me and me and Dwayne, right? Dwayne's into kickboxing. I'm into jujitsu. He's a fucking kickboxing nerd. I'm a jujitsu nerd, right? Yep. So it doesn't have to be the exact same. You know, you don't have to do it like this guy, but find your fucking grind. Find what it is that you'll be like, oh, you know what? Can't sleep. Let's go to work. Yep. 
You know, and then just do it. Then, then like, who cares that you're not sleeping? Who fucking cares? It doesn't matter. You're fucking, you're getting the fuck after something that you goddamn love. Absolutely. That adds value. Unlike binge watching TV shows or playing video games all night. And I got a lot of buddies that are my age and a little bit older and a little bit younger that they waste their lives away staring at a fucking tube or staring at a flat screen with nothing. And they say, oh, I just need to unwind a little bit. Like, that guy, that's not fucking true. You are wasting your life away because the next time we talk, you're complaining about you got problems with your relationship because you're not aware. You're not you're not in the moment. You, you, you're not you know, you're not thinking about the other person, how this impacts the other people in your household. Your job life kind of sucks because you just don't want to fucking be there. But you're not doing anything in that spare time to become a better employee, a better business owner or completely change your direction inside um, that sphere, inside that 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 work area. You know, you're not trying to become a better uh, a worker or provider. You know, so they have all these other issues or their health and fitness fucking suffers dramatically. Yeah. But they sit there. The average American. It's a mental thing, though, man. It's a, it's a it's a mental health thing, in my opinion. Yeah, you know? it's, I agree. It's a mental health thing. And, and the way out is, to, is is getting after it. And, and you know what? Like for everyone that might listen to this podcast, like if, if you work for somebody and you hate your job, look, do this. Become so good at that job that that, that the boss can't help but be like, damn, what's that guy doing? Treat yeah. it like it's yours. Treat it like it's yours and then watch the opportunities that, that open up. Watch the opportunities. And everyone thinks that they don't open up. Man, like you said, like what you did, I was the fucking janitor of the school. I was the, I was the, the second janitor of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Boulder that was owned by Amal Easton. And now I fucking own Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Boulder. It's called Easton Training Center. You know? And now I'm the owner. You know? So, but so, but I, I, you, you got to clean the school like it's yours. Yep. Right. Like I bet team team quest was never as clean as it was when you cleaned it ever, ever. There was but so much pride, pride. Yeah. Right. Just just do that the best you can. And all it is is practice. You're just practicing to do whatever is really going to matter yep. at the best of your ability. And, and when, when you don't work at the best of your ability, whatever it is you're doing, you, 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 you get into that flow with everything. You do it with your kids. You do it with your wife. You do it how you eat. Now your, your mind is suffering. Like Just do everything. Whatever you're doing, do it at the best of your ability. Look, you know what, man? I do like some down, down time. You know, I work all day. When I come home, I like to watch a TV show. My wife and I like to watch, you know, we're getting ready for Game of Thrones. I fucking love Game of Thrones. Yep. You know, it's great. It's cool. You know, but, but when it's Game of Thrones time, man, it's Game of fucking Thrones time. Yep. You know, we're going to sit there. I'm going to chill out. I'm going to relax. I'm, you know, and I'm going to really enjoy my Game of Thrones. Now, I don't watch Game of Thrones all fucking day, <laughs> you know, but, but, but I, I let you, you, I let myself have the down when, when the down comes, but when it's grind, it doesn't matter what I'm fucking doing. Yep. You know, I, when I make my coffee in the morning, I mean, I am fucking weighing my grind. I'm making the best fucking cup of coffee that I can goddamn fucking make for that 20 seconds. Absolutely. And that's what it comes down to. It's, it's the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Everything, yeah. And people don't get that. But they let's don't get it. Let's get it. It's not their fault. So I don't like to blame them, right? I, they, yeah, I, I do a little bit. I don't, I don't like to blame them. They just haven't heard the fucking message at the right time. You know, and that's they just haven't heard the fucking message at the right time. Cause I don't know what made me hear the message. Crying on my couch made me hear the message, you know, or yep. in, in my bed. I'm not sure why. Like, so, so I don't, I don't want to place blame on anyone, you know, yep. because it just, it doesn't go anywhere. It, it just, cre in my opinion, it just creates the fight to keep fighting. Well, fuck you and fuck you and fuck you. That's how you start saying fuck you is when yep. you start blaming people. So fuck that. I don't want to blame people for, um, their lack of. But let's come on. Let's hear the message. You know, let's hear the message. Who does it great is Joe. Joe does it the best, in my opinion. Rogan, you know, like you yeah. know, I think you've been on his podcast, right? Yeah, I have. Yeah, fuck yeah, it's everyone's goal. <laughs> like if you if you're in this realm, you want to get on Rogan's podcast. Um, it's it's a, you know because because he, he go ahead. No, it's his mind. But yeah, he is a genius in that realm where he can he can curate a conversation in a manner because it's we're having a great conversation here i think what rogan is able to do he can he has such a, a breadth of knowledge from so many aspects of life and he can make these associations and tie these conversations in where i'll be listening to his shit i forget what i'm doing 
Like I, it's like I, yeah. I zone out and I, you just get pulled into that fucking world. I'm not blowing smoke up his ass because I've been on the show twice. And it's like you're like, holy fuck, man. You get talking about this shit that's so deep you don't even realize I, that I had the ability to talk about some of that stuff with him. So, well, yeah, he, but, just, he just roganed, right? Like, like a mall a mall. He did <laughs> Joe. <laughs> he did Joe. That's he right. He did Joe. He did Joe. And now look where he is. Like when yep. he, you know, like what was the, I don't know. He talks about it all the time. Like the first show that fucking failed or whatever. And everyone's a lot. Now you're now, then he was the fear factor guy. And then he yep. was the dumb UFC guy. And now yep. look, yeah, fuck you. Yep. You know, Absolutely. fuck you. So, all right, man, I got to roll here. I got some, I got, I got some people pulling up to my house so we can work on our digital course for Easton. Oh, hell yeah, brother. Well, I love it. I love it. Well, one, one thing to the next, man, you know, one thing to the next, but I fucking, I, I love it. I love to do it. I'm not like, oh, damn, I got a podcast with Dolce today and then I got to fucking do this digital course. This, what? <laughs> <laughs> Buddy, this is, this is the life that we dreamt of, isn't it? Fuck yeah, man. Hey man, let's stay in touch, man. You know, I'm trying to, uh, I, so in my opinion, the gospel of fire, that's what my book is called, you know? Um, and it's not about like religion, but I, I, uh, I believe that what we have is each other. Yep. You know, so and the way that we do this the best is with other people. And, and when our purpose is surrounded around other people, then now the sky's the limit. When we try to do when, when we try to do the me thing, you know, and, and like the, the I'm better than you're worse than then then he, the, it's just going in a bad way. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reconnecting these days, reaching out to a lot of people that from my past that, you know, that I've met that do amazing things to spread the message of, of, of this, you know, and I think you're one of those dudes. So thanks for coming on, man. Ellie, it means a lot. I really appreciated seeing your name pop up on my phone and inviting me to be on. Thank you. And then let's get you on my show here soon. And let's talk about the gospel of fire. I'd love yeah. to let's love do it. You, you text, text me, text me afterwards and I'll get on your show. Done deal, homie. All right, homie. Thanks a lot, Mike. All right, Alec, be well, bro. Thanks. Bye. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. All right, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Gospel Fire. Don't forget to check me out on all of my social media at Fire Marshall 205. Again, at Fire Marshall 205. Go to my YouTube channel. Um, Fire Marshal 01, that is, for YouTube, where you can follow. I'm, I'm making these videos 100K strong. That's the goal for the year. I want 100,000 strong listeners to the Gospel of Fire. So I'm making, trying to make a video a week so that you guys can follow along on my journey of, of how I go about my day, some things that I talk about, some things that I try to work on for myself. And then finally, don't forget my website, ElliotMarshall.com, where you can get up to date with everything that has to do with me personally, the Gospel of Fire. You're going to find all about my book release. Um, also called the gospel fire February 12th it will be for sale on Amazon that whole week for 99 cents so all that information at elliotmarshall.com thanks again for listening thanks to my sponsors Evo Labs and Onnit so uh, that's it guys hope you enjoy the episode